I never thought, I mean, that today one would be speaking of an organization that is such a fantastic success. The reason why I joined Kakiso Trust is a little bit of a story. Uh, as a student, I was a student activist involved in the anti-apartheid movement. I was the national president of the Student Union for Christian Action and a national executive member of then ASASO. So when I completed my studies, I was assigned by my church to go and work in a very remote rural area in a homeland which was a vendor then. It was called an independent state because it was one of those homelands which opted for the so-called independence in 1979. By the time I arrived there, uh, I realized that the situation of the people on the ground there was very, very repressive, even much more than what was being experienced, more severe than what was experienced in the rest of South Africa. So together with a number of people, we started to uh, form resistance organizations. Uh, the first one we founded or we formed was called the Ecumenical Confessing Fellowship. And then from the Ecumenical Confessing Fellowship, we wanted to set up an institution that is going to help the people, especially in the areas of human rights, because human rights violations were, was a matter of the day by the state, by the police. So during that time, there was quite a mushrooming of what used to be called advice centers. So we wanted to set up our own advice centers. So we had a constitution, set it up, but we didn't have the money. <laughs> so we, I was tasked to go look for the funds. And uh, one of the organizations we heard about was uh, 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 the Kakiso Trust. We picked it up from our work in the SACC because by then I was also involved in SACC structures. So one of the board members that uh, I met there uh, was um, uh, Dr. Coleman. And I explained to him what I was looking for. He said he was going to help. But very interesting was that um, at the end of the conversation, he then invited me to join the trust. <laughs> After I've shared our vision with him, what we want to do, and that's how it all started. And then I was actually invited to serve in what they call a provincial committee, uh, Transvaal one. And I chaired the Transvaal committee. Now these committees of the Transvaal, primarily they used to look at uh, projects because Kakiso Trust, um, was not an implementing uh, institution then. It was supporting uh, community-based organizations and a lot of projects all over. So it was a grant funding kind of uh, organization. And so uh, because of the size of uh, the budget, the number of uh, applications which were coming, uh, applications used to go through uh, provincial committees. And then the provincial committees had delegations to approve some of them, but the bigger ones would be assessed and referred to the board, to the national board. Uh, and that's how I actually joined the trust. I had known about the trust previously, but never really thought I could sit on, the, on that board. And when I uh, was given that opportunity, because I already knew about the work of the trust and uh, what the trust is achieving and uh, what it is doing in society, I and uh, my passion for development and my passion for education, I felt that I could make a difference and uh, add value to the trust and make sure that the work of the trust gets a bigger footprint around the country and perhaps around the continent. I decided to join Kakiso because I would like to be with an organization that has got integrity. And I found that the evolution and the inception of Kahiso does points to an organization with a lot of conscience, a lot of integrity, and I want to be part of that. I, I got involved in the KT board soon after it was formed, and I used to represent Professor Herva on the board. Uh, the reason why, I thought it was during the emergency and Kakiso Trust 
was a recipient, recipient of EU funds and they were helping disadvantaged communities in a range of projects. Okay, I'm not quite sure why the then trustees approached me to join, um, but this was a long time ago. This was uh, probably in the early 1990s when I joined the Gakhiso Trust. I was on the trust for a couple of years and then when I became um, Director General in Agriculture, I became a patron. Then when I finished my job in government, I came back to as a trustee and basically I've been on and off the trust probably over 15, 20 years. Huge uh, budget which was meant for community development, helping communities in different places, victims of apartheid, and so it did an extraordinary work. But you know, after 94, it became a different institution. When I came back, I found it having developed to a level where it is much more able to do things that it could never do before, based on its own resources rather than on donors. And I think for me, the, the novel thing about the Cajiso Trust at the present moment is that it developed a sustainable model to be able to continue doing its work without depending on donors. Development of KTI as far as I was personally concerned because Eric had this crazy idea. He was concerned that as the country was becoming um, more normalized that funding that Kichiso was receiving would become government to government funding rather than funding that was going from government to an NGO. And the question he raised was if we think it's important that Kichiso Trust continue, we're going to have to be economically sustainable. And um, he liked the Ford Foundation or the Rockefeller Foundation as examples of foundations that were economically independent. And we thought that Eric was a little bit crazy because those were foundations that came after an entrepreneur had built an enormous business. How does, an eno how does a foundation create a business to sustain itself? And the rest is history. The moment when we actually attained financial independence and sustainability, and now professionalizing what we do in terms of saying that we are actually developing a model to transform educations and schools. And yeah, I think that, that that's, those have been the highlights for me. The launching of uh, schools. That's the highlight. That's where the joy overflows, because then you can see the results of the work that everybody else has put in. That's where it culminates with the schools. Highlights were to get to know people like Ombe, Eric Molobi, and a range of other individuals, some who are no longer with us, or Yunus Mohammed. So to indicate that I've worked with those comrades uh, always uh, uh, sparks good memories. Um, I don't know if there was one uh, particular highlight, but I think that with the coming of a, a legitimate government, many NGOs really uh, went underwater. I think the fact that Kahiso Trust did go under I mean, it was a um, shadow of itself, but made plans for real growth and sustainability by investing in, you know, um, in BEE, if you like. And today, I think it has, a, it is a leader in a sustainable uh, institutions and therefore for sustainable development. Wow. Um, I think one of the highlights was when we overcame the challenge of the EU stopping its funding to Kajiso. That was a very tough time. I think we used to meet so regularly and we're just so um, challenged and almost traumatized with what do we do now, you know. Uh, that, that was really, really, it was a tough time. So when we finally found a solution and uh, walked away from it and created the new model, which was essentially the KTI model. 
um, I think that for me was a highlight because we just created a whole new different model for both commercial and developmental activities. I think the, the, the most exciting part of this year for me was the launch of the infrastructure. I think it, it gave me a first-hand experience of the work of the Trust. You know, at, when we meet in, 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 at board level and we talk about what needs to be done and the facts and the figures, it doesn't speak to you, but when you there on the ground, in the community, it gives you a first-hand experience of what the Trust is achieving and then you feel proud to say, am I a part of this? And I was so surprised uh, that I had the opportunity to open uh, one of the halls. So my name is engraved somewhere in the, in the free state. Lessons that Kakhison learned up to about 95, 97 was that in order to make an impact, you need to look at, the pro at other factors around the projects that you are supporting. That's where the concept of a programmatic approach came. Now in the context of the development of school, for instance, the project that we are currently running in the Free State, we can see that the approach is not only to look at metric results in their own, but it's to look at all the other elements that can contribute to the school being run effectively and therefore producing good results. So the programmatic funding is now being implemented and I think that shows that Kahiso has grown gradually from funding one project with no impact in the location, maybe benefiting a few individuals to funding schools in area, taking into account other activities, taking into account other villages around the same schools. So that is uh, one of the uh, growth that Kahiso has experienced. So it's like this is a third phase of the uh, existence of Kahiso, the programmatic approach is being uh, in perfected, for instance, uh, in this school school development project. And it, is, it, it, it will probably produce very good models of development. It, the, the trustees decided what it is that they're going to focus on. Because there's so many NGOs. So the threat sometimes for NGOs is that you spread yourself thinly. But the decision just at least to focus on education because we're coming from a period where we were into everything. So a lot of things happened when the funding, external donor funding dried up. We had to rethink and say, what is it that we can do? And then in focusing, in having a narrow focus, it helped us to, to be good at what, to excel at, at, what we, at what we did. And also maybe just to document it and, and, and show it off as a model. I think Kirchiso Trust has remained relevant because we assess what we are doing, we look at ourselves and the environment, and we look at ourselves in that environment. And we keep a finger on the pulse of what's happening in the country and what's happening in the broader world of development. And if you look at how our work has grown from being simple grant making to the role we now play in the world of um, almost venture philanthropy, that we are at the cutting edge of finding sustainability in development finding independence for NGOs as we did it for ourselves. Katie had decided at an early stage it wanted to contribute to a post-apartheid South Africa. Now it got considerable experience in doing that during apartheid time. So it has that experience going beyond 94 and it continued to be a strong development agent. And it's a development agent that is essentially a non-government organization. So it, in a sense, contributes to development from civil society, etc. And I think that's quite important to have a, a civil society voice. Oh, it, it's always been relevant. I mean, the problems of this country are not nearly resolved. Uh, I think it's still engaged obviously in human development because of its major programs in um, education. Uh, but at the same time, I think the, you know, the trust agenda is practically about everything. Um, at least the trust deed. So we can do really any public service, um, 
you know, a program for development. And if you look where the problems are in the country, youth, uh, agriculture, the switches we are moving into now, leadership, everything. And, and the agenda is still so big, not just for the country and therefore for Kahiso. I think we're very grounded in society. I think each of the trustees comes from a very um, balanced, deeply rooted um, life. And I think, so we remain connected to what's important, that's one. And then I think the staff, the, the management, are just so in touch with the actual projects. They, they visit the projects. They try to get us to go and visit the projects so that we all have a, a hands-on sense of what's going on. The other thing is I guess we're all very interested in, in what's happening in South Africa. And so whilst we focus a lot on education, we also are aware, which, which is important for effective functioning, we're also very aware of what some of the other challenges are and therefore we've tried in different ways to engage, for example, in rural enterprise, we've tried to engage in, um, in, in, uh, in, in agriculture that's coming again. So we keep trying different things, but I think education has been our mainstay and we remain rooted in order to be able to know what's really going on in society. The programs of the trust speaks to the needs that is in South Africa at present. When you look at the matters that is confronting education in our country, uh, the need for norms and standards where schools don't even have basic infrastructure, water, electricity, and those are some of the things that the trust is addressing partly in some of our programs that we're rolling out and then also in terms of the computer programs that we're doing and a vast number of others. So the programs of the trust is very relevant to the needs uh, that is present in the communities. It is, it is the selflessness of most of the trustees because these are people who give of their time and compared to what they give of their time in order just to facilitate development and make sure that society survives, it surpasses any other you know, non-executive director role in mainstream business. I think that, they, that that's the kind of leadership probably that we all require. And that is what is so outstanding about the leadership of Castle Trust. The leadership has been able to bring its insights from both the days of the struggle and the insight many of the trustees have gained through working in government. And it tries to provide that insight to tackle contemporary problems, whether it's in education or housing or investments. I think uh, what is significant for me, I was thinking about it this morning, the fact that uh, even when we think we've gone really underwater, is that the vision of the trust was um, absorbed by all, especially the executives, management, and people who worked for the organization, so that they took leadership when uh, many of the leaders went into government, in you know, ambassadors and all, they retained. And so that today, some of the executives I found 25, 20, whatever years ago, uh, and, you know, I'm sitting with them now as trustees. The program managers and everything, like Kozo and everything, are now the CEOs because they have kept the vision. And even when we got into a, corporate business through KTI, when they thought that the vision was not, of those who were running the company, was not really um, plowing back to development. It is the management that you know, decided to get into the business side to, in order to draw it back to where we're supposed to go to. So the leadership is that is correct leadership that everybody in the Kahiso Trust is the leader of the trust. We've had different leaders. Um, we, we've had, I think there was the, and I think each leader, each chairperson has contributed their bit. Um, I think we had Eric, and then we had uh, Eunice, and then I also was chair for a while. 
and now we have Zwo. And I think the combination of the chair, and we also had, also had Dr. Ngomo at one point. So I think the combination of the leadership of the chair, but also the collective and the way in which the trustees make decisions um, has been rich. You know, you have a chair and a, a board of trustees, but actually each one of us uh, brings our own leadership qualities to the table and the others respect that input. And I think that's what um, has helped us be, remain where we are and actually grow. We've grown a lot, yeah. I think the leadership over the years, and I'm, and I'm talking about the legacy that was left for um, the, the trust and the trustees, a, a proud legacy were left by one, the patrons, and also some of the former trustees that have built up a sustainable and a, a, a financially sound organization, an organization where they pride themselves of good governance. And it is for me such a privilege to be part of an organization where you don't need to come and put systems in place. The systems are already there. It is refining and tweaking and improving from the existing systems that are there. So I, I take proud pride in the work that the leadership has done thus far. And our role and my role is just to support the work of the leadership in taking the trust forward. Now that we have reached a stage where the, the efforts that have been made for the last 15 years are now bearing fruit, we are now able to get dividends which are able to support the work of the Kahiso Trust to a level where no other NGO I know of has reached, especially here in South Africa. I think we have got an extraordinary responsibility. One, to be able to do what we are supposed to do, because we have the means to do so, but also to help other organizations, civil society organizations, to also look at models to make them self-sufficient and sustainable so that they don't depend on donor um, money. I think Kakasok should continue in the uh, current role of dealing with uh, educational and socio-developmental challenges, but also influence the way, uh, influence policy and influence the way the country is governed, influence the way our institutions are run. I mean, our there are lots of strategic institutions, government is just but one, um, and influence the way they are run and advise as a result of experience that the trust has uh, gathered over the years. I really believe that the South African educational system has enough resources to fund poor, able learners. I think they, they, they do have enough resources, but uh, to the extent that we assist uh, these kids to access those resources, I think it's a good program. Um, so the schools, uh, BEARS, you know, this school's development program, old school, it's also a very exciting kind of a project, but I can tell you that one of the things that I would, uh, I wish I could live to see is our success in terms of uh, building models which are replicable in the rest of Africa. So Kahiso Africa is the most exciting thing to me now because uh, I believe that um, uh, in many other African countries, I believe Africa is very wealthy. Uh, that's my own view. We've got a lot of resources, but uh, then you have got a lot of poverty. And part of the reasons why there's a lot of poverty is because very few people benefit from the wealth in Africa. Now, if you have an institution like Akiso Trust that is going to tap into the resources, not for individual or personal wealth, not to build uh, individual billionaires, but to be able to plow back into community development programs to uplift not only individuals, but whole communities. I think that is a kind of area uh, or a thrust or a development uh, which is very exciting at this particular moment and we are uh, putting a lot of effort into it and we hope that we are going to be successful indeed in this endeavor. I think Kakiso Trust need to in a more determined way contribute to the two big challenges this country faces. The first of, its, first of which is employment creation 
and the second is education. If you get those two problems right, then this country can go quite far. Um, I, think, I think if you'd asked that question probably five, ten years ago, I might have said, well, maybe we might become less relevant in, in, a, in the developing country context. But I think I'm now more convinced that you do need strong civil society organizations. And I think the Kakhisu Trust model, which is both a combination of uh, civil society development as well as um, the, the commercial dimension, so the dividend flow um, initiatives help it sustain, I think we need to, re we, we will be around for a long time. Um, and I think that what will probably happen over time is we'll deepen our knowledge and capability in terms of education models, but we will also add on two or three other complementary models, which we're going to have to evolve over time. So I think we're going to be around for a long time. I want to uh, congratulate uh, the trustees and the staff uh, on fabulous work. Uh, uh, the things that they are doing with the scholarship, the Eric uh, Mulobi scholarship, uh, the Bears No Deer school program is just out of this world. And I, I can't uh, commend you uh, enough. Um, uh, you, you were uh, like a, uh, a, a caterpillar which has become one of the most beautiful butterflies. Uh, and we look forward to your uh, continuing to do this fabulous work um, in, in education, in scholarship production, uh, so that many of our young people uh, in the rural areas especially uh, you say to them, the sky is the limit, reach for the stars, you can be anything you want to be. Thank you.